open up your Bibles, if you would, this morning to Genesis 13. Genesis 13. Every day I get up, and every day I will end up turning on the news. I don't, I don't watch a lot of news, but I read much more of my news. I get it online and in some different places. But every day that I watch the news or read the news or, or try to keep up with the news, and you're probably like me, it seems like we're always further down the hill than we were the last time I looked at the news. To, truth be told, sometimes we're further down the hill in the evening than we were in the morning. Some days it just seems like we're, we're kind of speeding up our, our acceleration as we head downhill as a society. Things that were only whispered about in the 80s were laughed at in the 90s. Things that were laughed at in the 90s were made acceptable in the 2000s. And then things that are acceptable in the 2000s have now become celebrated. And actually, we're, we're starting to criminalize those who don't celebrate as a society. Culture has gone beyond demanding tolerance. You remember when tolerance was the big word? That, that was what we heard all the time. You don't hear a whole lot about that anymore. <clears throat> tolerance used to be it. We've gone beyond tolerance to requiring acceptance and celebration, which is something we know we can't do. We, we know that we're not able to do that because God calls what society and culture celebrate, God calls it sin. And, and obviously when I, when I start bringing up these topics, our, our minds immediately go to the, the homosexual agenda. And that's bad, it's wicked, it's an abomination before God, he says. But there's a whole lot more wrong with society than the gay agenda. <laughs> there, that's, that's one of them, and it's one of the kind of the keystones that we see. If you read through Romans chapter 1, we know that Romans 1 actually says that that's one of the, one of the road markers as you're on your way towards destruction. So it's, it's not out of line for us to identify that as definitely something to, to be aware of, but there's a whole lot more than that. Every day, we're forced to decide how we will react to the growing darkness in which we find ourselves. Every single day, if, if you tune into the news, even if you don't tune into the news, if you go out in public and somebody says, hey, what do you think of, and, and you're, you're going to be put on the spot for an opinion. We know that participation is out of the question. Right? We can't participate in the sins of the world. We can't participate in, in what's going on right now. 2 Corinthians 6, 1 says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate. separate. We're supposed to be separate. So, involving ourselves, saying, Oh, you know what? I think it's great. As a matter of fact, I do. And fill in the blank with whatever the sin of the, of the hour is. We're supposed to come out and be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So, participation is out of the question. And I don't, I don't think that that's news to anyone here this morning. Okay? Can't participate. Shouldn't we, we don't want to because if any man be in Christ, he's a new, new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. My wants have changed since I'm in Christ. Maybe, now this would be one that we, we could be tempted to do. We're tempted to withdraw and kind of isolate. Well, I'll just, I'll just pull in because it's not happening in my house. It's not happening in my church. It's not happening with my friends. So I can just, I can isolate from this. But to withdraw completely from what's going on would be to hide our light, wouldn't it? Yeah. And we've been told in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You and I should be distinctly different, visibly different, and my visible difference is supposed to point people to how good I am and how good my upbringing was. No. No, what's, it's supposed to point people to my heavenly father. It's, it's to be a, I'm, I'm to be a road sign on the way to God. I'm to point people towards Christ. But, so withdrawal is also not really an option if we want to be, if we want to do what God says. We try to guard against apathy and fatalism. What does that mean? Well, I don't care what they do in California. Just, just leave me alone. 
just if they can just if they can just do their thing and leave me out of it or the other side of, of, of that you know what they're gonna do what they're gonna do there's nothing we can do to change it or stop it so whatever okay is is it possible have you maybe you maybe you'd say you know I've talked to people with that or maybe you you'd honestly say I've even had those thoughts myself I think you know what the, the world's going down in flames, and there's nothing I can do, so whatever. Is that, is that what we should do? No. Well, in Psalm chapter 73, verse 5, David describes the wicked, and he kind of has this, this mentality. He says, they're not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. He's talking about the wicked. Does it seem like that sometime? He says... Therefore, pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence overcometh them as a garment. The world is just their past hope. There's nothing we can do. Let's just, let's just enjoy the ride down. It's not what we should do. Apathy and fatalism are not it. We, we frequently express our disgust. Okay, that's another option. We can be vocal in our disgust. <clears throat> We pray with David in Psalm 5, verse 10. <clears throat> Destroy thou them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against thee. And we, we express our disgust, perhaps in person, perhaps online. <laughs> we, we get on and we'll leave a lengthy post or we'll, we'll, we'll repost somebody else who, who left a, a lengthy post of, boy, this is, this is how it is and it's terrible. Is disgust appropriate for what's going on in society? Is, is there something dirty about what's going on in society? Yeah, something dirty. Is disgust, is disgust possible? Well, well, we'll look at it here in just a minute. We're turning to Genesis chapter 13, and there was a place in Scripture that drew four very different responses from four very different individuals. This morning, we're going to see how to deal with a wicked world, a wicked culture, a wicked society, by looking at four looks at Sodom. Four looks at Sodom. There are four very distinct responses to the wickedness that we see in Sodom, and we're going to look at those here this morning. We're going to start off in Genesis chapter 13, and we're going to see the first response, and you'll, you'll jump to say, that's not right, a look of compromise. A look of compromise. This is Lot's look. This is how Lot. Uh, this is how Lot adapted to the culture. The context here in Genesis chapter thirteen. Abram. He's not called Abraham yet. That will come. Abram and Lot are have have journeyed together out of Ur of the Chaldees, and they've come, and now they're dwelling in the land of Canaan. They've come over to the land of Canaan. And Abram and Lot are both very wealthy men in an agricultural society. They have large flocks. They have large herds. And the land is not sufficient to sustain both men living close together. It's a common problem. This wasn't unique to Abram and Lot. All, all people have this. When you have too big of a herd, you don't have enough grass to feed all your animals. You have to, you have to space out a little bit. So... It's not an intrinsically uh, sinful problem that Abram and Lot were facing. Abram goes to Lot, and he offers him the first choice of dwelling. And Abram says, if you go to the right hand, I'll go to the left. If you go, if you go this way, I'll go the opposite. So you choose. He gives Abram, gives the choice that the older and the more, the more wise gives the choice to the younger. And as we will see, more foolish. Look at verse 10 of Genesis 13. It says, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Verse 10, Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other, Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, Lot dwelt in the cities of the plains, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. Now, this seemingly innocuous choice that was made by Lot is 
of momentous impact. Lot's life, because of this choice, what we read about there in verse 11, that he pitched his tent towards Sodom, he begins to circle the drain. As a man, he's going to begin to take his family down a dark path towards destruction, one that he would not have foreseen as being before him. <coughs> Waking every day to the sights of Sodom in the distance began to desensitize the lot to the evil that was before him. Sodom is a place of sin. We, we have the, the, the name of a sin that's named after Sodom. We have sodomy, and so a wicked, evil place. And, and Lot, every morning, he opens up, he walks out of his tent after he wakes up, stretches, yawns, gets his first cup of coffee, and looks at Sodom. He sees it every morning. He would have dealings with those people. Again, lots of, lots of herdsmen. He's a shepherd. So his, his flocks go over and, and end up mingling with the flocks of Sodom. And so Lot starts having more and more to do with the people of Sodom, and he's desensitized to it. He, he says, what, what would have made Abraham go, Ooh. Lot says, oh, we see that every day. We see that all the time. We see that sin multiple times a day. You'll see that three times before lunch. The next time we read about Lot is in Genesis chapter 14. Flip over and look at the next, next here in Genesis 14, verse 12. There's a, there's a battle that's going on in the region of, of, of this valley. It says, And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. You notice something about that? First, in chapter 13, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. Where is, where is he in Genesis 14, 12? He lives there. Why? Well, he was desensitized to it. Living in the city in this day especially would have had its advantages. So he, he just kind of sets up shop in town. Again, he started out with Abraham, or Abram, a man who God talked to, and, and, and this tremendous relationship, and now he's first he starts looking towards it, he's desensitized to it, now he's abandoned his tent outside of the city and taken up residence in this evil place. What he was desensitized to, now he's become comfortable with. If, if you're paying attention, you'll note that this is also the track we go down. Okay? He became desensitized to it. Then he got comfortable with it. <laughs> Several months pass, and the narrative of Abram is interrupted again to give us Lot's story. Flip to Genesis 19. Genesis 19 says, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. He started out pitching his tent that direction, then he ends up living there, and now we find him in the gate. He's sitting in the gate. Now that's, in this culture, it's a little bit bigger of a deal. The gate, if you read through Ruth, you'll find that when you wanted to see the elders of the town, you went to the gate. Okay, that was, think of it as city hall. They didn't have a building dedicated to the government. They had the gate. And the rulers of the city, the, the people who, who, who made the decisions in the city, they lived, or they, they would go to the gate, and that's where they would sit, and they would hold court. We'll find out a little bit later, if you read through Genesis 19, that Lot was actually called a judge. In Sodom. Now, whether judges were elected by democratic process or whether they were selected, we don't know. But Lot has gone from pitching his tent towards Sodom to living in Sodom to having a place of authority in Sodom. Do, do you see what's happening? You see how you see how how we're circling down. Lot's look in Genesis chapter thirteen was one that began a long trail of consequences and compromises that he never thought he'd make. If you would have gone up to Lot when he and Abram were choosing directions and you'd have told Lot what was ahead in his story, he'd have said, you're a fool. There's no way I'll do that. There's no way that I'll make those choices, but it starts out, nobody takes the jump, or very few people take the jump from living a, a, a good and a moral life to gross sin. It's a, it's a process 
of little steps, of little compromises. That's what Lot did. This is the same downward spiral that we see laid out in Psalm 1, verse 1. You know the verse. It says, blessed is the man that walketh not. Walketh not. That's the, that's the least comfortable that you can get, right? Walking or running. When I'm moving, I, I'm on my way. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth. It's a little more comfortable. Nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. It's a process. It's a it's a a step by step by step place where you you're walking through, and then you think, well, it's okay. And before you know it, you're sitting and you're comfortable. Compromise doesn't happen in big chunks. Compromise happens in little steps. Compromise happens primarily here in your mind, in your heart. It happens here because why? Well, we, we rationalize. Well, everybody's doing it. So I'll just, but you fill in the blank with whatever just is. Well, if I don't do it, then people are going to think, this about me or that about me or I'll, I'll lose friends. I'll lose, I'll lose my abilities to do such and such. And we rationalize and we talk ourselves into compromise. Yeah. That's the first look at Sodom. Lot's look was a look of compromise. He, he took gradual steps that took him from standing next to Abram on a plane to sitting in the seat of a judge in the gate of Sodom. That's a long way. How did he get there? Well, one step at a time. Compromise. The first look. The second look. One of condemnation. Turn back to Genesis 18. Genesis 18. While you're turning there, I'm going to put Genesis 13, verse 13, up on the, up, up on the screen. It says, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord. Exceedingly, you know God's opinion of Sodom. I'm not, I'm not breaking news to you to tell you that God was not okay with what was going on there. Again, the wickedness of Sodom has forever been associated with immorality and sexual debauchery. But the context here of Genesis chapter 18, Abram is an old man and he's sitting in the door of his tent and he sees three, three men. And I put that in quotes on purpose because they weren't really men. He sees three men who are coming towards him. They're angels, and one of them is the angel of the Lord. It's a, a theophany. Do you remember what that, what that word means? A theophany is a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord. So before Jesus came down and was born in Bethlehem, he, he appeared throughout the Old Testament several times to several different people. This is a, a theophany or a Christophany, a, a Christ appearance, pre-incarnate. They have a conversation, they're talking, and, and they talk about Abraham first. They talk about Abraham and Sarah and his heir situation and the fact that he doesn't have any kids, but God has promised that his descendants will be as the sands of the sea. They talk about that, but after some conversation, look at verse 16 of Genesis 18. It says, and the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom. And Abraham, his name's been changed, went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? God's come down for a purpose. He's come down to see. Whenever God comes down to see the wickedness of men, it never ends well for men. He did this in Genesis a little bit earlier. He came down at Babel to see the wickedness of men. And there he confused their languages and men spread out across the face of the earth. <clears throat> God comes down this time to witness, to see the wickedness of Sodom. The wickedness of Sodom is, is laid out for us. Look at verse 20. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. Did God not know what was going on in Sodom? God knows everything. Does God have to come to your house to see how things are? No, God is 
everywhere present. <laughs> if, you, if you want to say it this way, God was in Sodom. Why? Because God is everywhere. So God knew what was going on. But in this particular case, their sin had risen to the level that God decided this merits personal and physical attention. And so God descends down again, a Christophany or a theophany, and he comes and he's going to find out what's going on in Sodom in a personal way. He's going to go see. Sodom wasn't getting away with anything. Their wickedness was noticed by heaven. Do you ever get the feeling that, kind of like David, like we read earlier, that the world's getting away with an awful lot right now? They're not. They're not. You see what's going on in America. You see what's happening in our culture. You see what's happened in the last couple of weeks when it comes to, to the sexual debauchery that's being pushed and the, the abortion that's being pushed and the lies that are being told about everything under the sun, and you think, well, they're just getting away with it. No. And they're not. No. And that should come as great, uh, as great comfort to you that God is, in fact, keeping score. God knows exactly Amen. what's going on. Amen. Proverbs 15, verse 3 says, <clears throat> The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Now, that should have a, a comforting as well as a frightening aspect to it. Why? Well, if you're doing good, you think God sees, God knows, and God will give credit. If you're doing bad, though, what does that mean? It means that God is also aware of what's going on. When God looked at Sodom, he looked with a look of condemnation. Did God know what was going to happen before he came down? Yes. yes. God knew exactly what was going on. He came down. I would make the case he came down more to have the conversation with Abraham than he did to decide whether or not he was going to do something in Sodom. God knew what was coming. God's look was one of condemnation. Let's look now at this third look. It's a look of carelessness. This is one we need to be careful of. I would say that if one of these would be our tendency, this would probably be it. This is Lot's wife. God saw the wickedness of Sodom, and you know the story. I don't need to retell everything about it to you. God sends two angels, and they go into the city of Sodom. They come, and they find Lot, and they tell Lot, we're going we're gonna to spend the night in the city. We'll just stay out in the streets. And Lot says, oh, no, you don't want to do that. You come to my house. I'll, I'll give you a place to stay tonight. Do angels need a place to stay for the night? No. No, they, they would have been fine. No <laughs> doubt. Okay? But... Lot doesn't know that's what they are at this point. So he said, you guys come over to my house. They come in, and the, the two angels have a purpose. Their purpose is to tell, is to tell, the, uh, tell, tell Lot and his family it's time to get out. Do you remember why? Well, because of what Abraham had done earlier, which we'll look at uh, a little bit later. We'll look at Abraham. They were there to tell Lot and his family to, to get out. Lot is unable to persuade his married children and his sons-in-law and his, his, his in-laws, his, perhaps his grandchildren. He's unable to persuade them, hey, you need to get out. God's going to do something here. God's going to judge this city. And so the angels do convince Lot. And again, there's a whole lot more that we're just kind of glossing over here. The men of the city came. And they said, hey, send these two guys out so that we may know them. Knowing mean, obviously, a, a sexual type of a sin. They say, send these guys out. Lot says, no, I can't send them out. But here, I'll send my daughters out. What in the world? Now, again, can you imagine telling Lot that he would do that back when he was standing on the plane with Abraham making a choice? If you would have gone up to Lot and you said, hey, just a couple of years from now, you're going to offer your two virgin daughters to a crowd of perverts. What do you think he'd have said? He said, you're out of your mind. There's no way I'd do that. He'd get upset. If he was half a man, he'd probably slap you. Why? Because well, you're insulting. I will not. What, what, what made the difference? The compromise. He, he started out making bad choices. And here he is offering his daughters to a crowd of perverts in Sodom one night to protect some angels. Ah, it, it goes against our grain. It, it should, okay? But 
It's time to run. Genesis 19, verse 16. The angels have told him, hey, God's going to destroy the city. You need to get out. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, escape for thy life. This is the angel talking to Lot. He says, escape for thy life and look not behind thee. Neither stay thou in all the plain, escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Lot's kind of dawdling around, and the angels say, no, it's time to move now. They pick them up, they take them to the outside of the city, and they give them stern instructions. Hey, get out, run, and don't look back. It's, they did say, don't look back. That was part of their verbal instruction. Don't look back. And as Lot and his wife and two daughters begin to run, judgment starts to fall on the city. There's fire. There's brimstone. Have you ever heard somebody get burned? It, it's not quiet. And there's a whole city of people who are burning. People, again, Lot has family in the city. Okay? He has married children, perhaps grandchildren, and they're behind as fire and brimstone starts to fall on the city. Okay? So, lest we think, well, Lot's well, wife just shouldn't have looked back because you know what's coming. She, she had reason to look back. Her, her, her children were back there. It was a horrible thing. Verse 26 spells it out for us. It says, but his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Instant. Instant judgment. Irreversible. Terminal judgment. But why? Why would she do this? Well, because of carelessness. Because she'd allowed herself to become one with the wickedness of the city. She loved the things behind her. Her house was back there. All of her stuff was back there. Again, her family was back there. She turned to have one last look. And God struck her down. Does the tendency still exist? This tendency for us to develop an affinity or a love for the things of the world? Absolutely it does. John, 1 John chapter 2 verse 15. John commands us, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What does it mean to love the world? I love certain I, I love some of my, my stuff. I love my family. I, I love my, my stuff. If you were to, to talk to my, my daughters, they love our dog. They're, they're, is, is it wrong? Are they sinning to do that? You, you've got things that you like, and you, you'd even say, I love such and such. Is that what this is talking about? No. No. No, this is talking about when we elevate the things of the world into a position they have no business being in. What should be first and foremost? Number one, God. I should say who should be that? God. God. God should be there. And anything, anyone that I put above God is an idol. And I'm breaking this command here in John to love not the world. If What, what makes you truly upset? Is it, is it the sin that you see going on around you? Is it, is it the, the blasphemy against the holy God? Or is it, I, I, I couldn't get an appointment at such and such a place. I couldn't make reservations. Well, it's okay. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. It's possible. It's even likely that believers can develop a love even for the wickedness of the world. Right? Even the wickedness, even, no, not the, not the gross things, at least not at first. But we can develop a taste, we can develop an affinity for those things. With the availability of evil today, this is something that certainly must be guarded against. You and I need to be careful. The reason that it's a command, love not the world, is because our tendency is to love the world. So God gives us a command. He says, hey, don't. 
Don't love the world. Don't place things that are of the world above your love for God. Don't place things in God's seat. He, even, even yourself. Lot's wife's look at Sodom was one of carelessness. There's a verse in the New Testament. It's a real short one. It just says, remember Lot's wife. That's the whole verse. Why would God inspire that in the New Testament all those thousands of years later? Because there's a lesson to be learned here. The lesson is the angels took Lot's wife out of Sodom, but they didn't take Sodom out of Lot's wife. She still had a lot of that, that desire, that, we'll call it what it is, love for the city, this carelessness that she had. You need to be careful in your love for the world. Stuff has a tendency to creep in importance in our lives. We live in a materialistic society. Stuff, money, the stuff money can buy tends to grow in importance. And if you're not careful, if you're not deliberately taking steps to ensure that it doesn't happen, you will find one day that you've allowed stuff to pass the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. The last look <clears throat> is one of concern. It's Abraham's look. Look at verse chapter 18. Flip back. Remember when Abraham spoke to those visitors at his tent? We talked about it a little bit when we looked at God's look of condemnation. But God decided to tell Abraham what he was going to do to the wicked city of Sodom. Now, do you figure Abraham knew about the wickedness of Sodom? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There are probably, in this area, towns within a hundred mile radius. And if you, somebody were to say that town, you'd say, oh, that's not a good place. You'd, Why? Well, because of such and such. Towns develop reputations, don't they? Okay? Towns still had reputations back then. Abraham would have had some knowledge of Sodom if he had anything to do with Lot, which he had had some contact with him, he would have known just how bad it was. And so God comes and he tells Abraham that he's going to destroy the city of Sodom. I want you to look and you'll see, if you start in verse 22 and you look down, look for what Abraham doesn't say. He doesn't say, good, fry him, Lord. Enough. Enough of those people breathing your air and wasting our time. Fry them. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, well, if anyone deserves it, it's those people, those despicable citizens of Sodom peddling their filth all over the place. Lord, nail them. Do it. What does Abraham do? Look at verse 22. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Who's he thinking about? Lot. Lot. <laughs> I've got a nephew who lives down there. Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked. That the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? What's the answer to that last question? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Of course the judge of all the earth is going to do right. But Abraham, his, his knee-jerk reaction, when, he, when God says, I'm going to destroy the city, Abraham's knee-jerk response is, oh Lord, no. Lord, what about the righteous? He's not looking for the destruction. He's looking for mercy. He's looking with compassion. He's looking with concern. Abraham's concern is for the people. Lord, what, what would it take to get you to spare the city? Sometimes we get this backwards. We think, Lord, how much more is it going to take before you strike those people dead? Right? We might not say it that way, but we think it. Lord, how much more are you going to take? Abraham says, Lord, what would it take you to stay your hand? And Abraham starts with 50. He says, Lord, if there are 50 righteous, 
God says, for 50 righteous, I'll spare the city. Well, Lord, how about for 45? For 45, I'll spare the city. <clears throat> 40? Yeah, I'll, I'll spare it for 40. And they work down. And they come to 10. 10 righteous. And I can make the case to you that there should have been 10 people. Okay? There should have been 10 people at least. If you count up the members of Lot's family, Abraham probably thought when he said, will you spare it for 10? He probably thought because he would have thought surely Lot has at least reached his family and God will spare the city. But as we've already noticed, Lot hadn't reached his own family. As believers, we should look at sin for what it is. Sin is disgusting. Sin is what hung Christ on the cross. John Bunyan, the man who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, he wrote a good definition of sin. He said, sin is the dare of God's justice, the rape of his mercy, the jeer of his patience, the slight of his power, and the contempt of his love. Sin's serious. Sin's disgusting. Sin's, it, it should make your skin crawl. It should, but sin should also bring pity. You should also pity those who are lost in sin and take action on that pity. The world, our world, 2022, our world is headed for a fiery judgment worse than that of Sodom. But there's a way out. So the world doesn't, the, the world, I'm not talking about the physical world, I'm talking about the people. There's a way out of facing that fiery judgment. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus made an escape. And it's our job to tell everyone that we can about it. That look of Abraham, a look of concern when he looked at Sodom. So I want you to take just a moment and I want you to evaluate yourself. We've looked at four different looks at Sodom this morning. Let's run over them, and I'll ask them kind of in the form of a question. For a lot, are you compromised? Have you started down that path? Maybe you're not way down the path, but you've taken a couple steps down that path. Have you allowed yourself to begin the downward spiral of growing comfortable with sin, desensitized to sin? It will end in your involvement. That's where that path leads. There's, there's no other place that it goes. You will become comfortable and desensitized. Before you know it, you'll be involved. Psalm 51 verse 10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Maybe we need to spend some time praying that God would help sin to bother us more. Because in our culture, it's kind of acceptable, isn't it? Everybody's doing it. Maybe we need to spend a little bit of time praying, Lord, help sin to rub me wrong. Help it to bother me like it bothers you. Are you compromised? Do you realize the condemnation of God? When God looked at Sodom, he looked with condemnation. Ephesians 4 verse 6 says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. It's okay to be angry about some of the stuff that we see today. It should run all over you. It's okay. The acceptability of immoral behavior, the loss of innocence for our children, the murder of the unborn, that should make you angry in a righteous way. That should bother you in the pit of your being. It should, it should just be, it, oh, it, should, it should drive you crazy. That's okay. But I want you to note in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, God looked down. This was just before he destroyed the world with a flood. And the world was just a terrible place. Sin everywhere. And we read in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. It's okay for you to look and to be angered by the, the sin that we see running rampant. But more than it angers you, it should grieve you. You should be grieved in, your, in, in the, the core of your being because of what sin does. 
It bothers God, and thus it should bother me. The third look, are you careless with the world? Are you attached to the things of the world? Have you allowed your love for the stuff of the world to surpass your love for Christ? When Paul was preparing to die in 2 Timothy, he mourned the loss of Demas, who had served with him in the ministry. He said in 2 Timothy 4, verse 10, For Demas hath forsaken me. Why? Because he's loved this present world. That's something we can do as well. When you and I start loving the world, the Bible says no man can serve two masters. He'll either hate the one and love the other, or he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and men. And it's true. <clears throat> Are you careless with the world, with your relationship with the world? You do well to mind it. And then lastly, Abraham looked at Sodom and his first response was concern. Compassion. Are you concerned for those around you? Are you concerned for, for the lost? How about the bad ones? Okay, and I know that's not theologically proper how I state that. How about the really bad ones? How do you feel? Do you have concern? Do you have compassion? Are you praying for their soul? There are politicians and public figures with whom I vehemently disagree. I think they're wrong whenever they open their mouth. They, they're constant. Everything they do, and it's not, it's not just they slip up. They're determined and set to go against the God I love and the God who gave his son for me. That, that should inspire my compassion for them. I should pray that the Lord would save them. In Isaiah 59, verse 16, God looked down on the nation of Israel, which was going into sin. It says, and he saw that there was no man, and he wondered that there was no intercessor. God is looking right now at our nation, I can make a case, and he wants there to be intercessors. You should pray for the people you disagree with. You should pray. You see these little snippets. If you go online, you see little snippets of people saying terrible things. In the last, in the last two weeks, in the last week, really, there's been a whole lot coming out about Disney. Have you, have you noticed any of that? And you see, and it's filth. It's disgusting. It's despicable what's happened. And, and it's easy for us to get angry. And there's, it's okay to get angry at the results of sin, to hate what that's going to do to children. But... Pray for that person. Pr pray for the person who's saying those things. Why? Because they're not beyond the mercies of God. God could save them. You say, I don't know if God could save this political leader. I've given the illustration many times. God saved Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar skinned his prisoners of war alive and painted mountains with their blood. Okay? We don't have a leader who has risen to the debauchery of Nebuchadnezzar. But God saved you. So what should you do? Pray. You and I need to be careful. We need to be careful. Number one, don't, don't compromise. Don't start down that path. It ends in a terrible place. Realize the condemnation of God and allow it to spur you to tell people about the good news of the gospel. Don't be careless in how you deal with the things of the world. Don't start loving the things of the world because when I start elevating the things of the world... They start to push God out of his rightful place. And then lastly, be concerned. It's easy for us to, to say, yeah, I'm concerned about what's going on, but what are you doing about it? Are you praying? Are you sharing the good news of the gospel? There's only one thing that can fix America. And it's not dependent on the R or the D following the name of the person in the White House or in Congress or anywhere. It's Jesus Christ. America needs revival. A spiritual revival. Amen. And it's going to happen when God's people realize that this is true. When we, when we refuse to compromise, when we understand the condemnation of God, when we don't allow ourselves to be careless with the things of the world, and when we manifest and show our concern for those who are lost. Let's bow for a word of prayer this morning.
Our Father in heaven, I pray that you would help us as your children to, to do and to live in a right relationship with the world in which we find ourselves. Lord, it's dark. What we're seeing defies imagination sometimes. We, we can't believe where we've come as a society. But Lord, I pray that we would allow that, that those, those thoughts, that anger, Lord, that, that, that confusion to push us closer to you and to push us to action. Lord, I pray that we would be a group of people who are interceding on behalf of our leaders and behalf of those who are making decisions in our culture. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be lights of the gospel of Christ in a very dark place, in a very dark time. And we'll give you all the praise for what you accomplish as you work through us. We pray all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.